Hebrews in chapter 12, and beginning in verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would write its truths on our hearts indelibly, change lives by the truth of your word and the truth of your gospel, and be glorified in all this. We look to Christ in this. Help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to hear and heed the word of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. We are runners in a race, whether you're six years old, 13 years old, 83 or 103, as a Christian, you're in a race. It's a race of endurance. It's not a sprint. No prizes will be handed out for running the fastest lap in history. It's all about getting to the finish line, finishing well. We're in Hebrews chapter 12, but I invite you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 just for a moment. We'll read familiar words of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, we read these familiar words. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Do you know that? Do you not know that? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and bring it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Then on to the right in our Bible, to the book of Philippians, you find 2 Corinthians to the right, and Galatians, Ephesians, then the book of Philippians, chapter 3, where again, we see something similar in terms of athletics and prizes. Look in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I, that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. With these words familiar to us, now ringing in our ears, let's go back to the book of Hebrews, where in verse 1, we read the word therefore. If you've uh, listened to me for any length of time, you'll know this. Whenever you see a therefore, we ought to ask, what is it there for? And it's there because of all that's come before. The word therefore connects us with all that's gone before, and that is an allusion to chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the word cloud here is a metaphor for a throng, a large host, a great group of people. Witness after witness after witness. We're surrounded by them. Well, who are they? Well, again, from the context, these are the Hall of Faith members that we've just read about in chapter 11, the people of God, runners of the past. In other words, you're not the first to embark on the race. You're not the first person that 
God has said, I want you to run. No. God has caused others to run long before you and I came on the scene. And what is in view, the cloud of witnesses are Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and then the list of individuals, men and women, that are unnamed from verse 33 to the end of the chapter in chapter 11. These are witnesses. Witnesses to the fact that God causes people to have faith, and that faith then expressed, pleases God in the midst of all he puts before us in life. Some things, as we saw last time, are good. Some things are hard. Never believe the promise of some that come to Christ and all your problems will be over. You'll have no bank account problems. You'll have no physical infirmities. Come to Christ, it'll all be over. Just come to Christ. No. We saw last time the Bible, in fact, the very chapter that teaches faith in an extreme way because it's all about the message of faith, tells us some things are good, some things are hard. Some people saw the power of God as they believed God. Others endured torture and were sawn in two. Some things good, some things hard, according to the providence of God. And ladies and gentlemen, each of you, each of us, are in this race as Christians. And God determines how that race will be in your life. For some people, it means you float free and you have very little in the way of trials. I'd like to meet you if that's after the service. You've never had a trial. You're still awaiting your first. But for most others, there are things we have to press through and we think, I can't believe I'm having to go through this. And it comes, your experience and mine, through the filter of the providence of God. He's chosen this this very circumstance and the ones that follow as your race. That's your race. You might have preferred a different race. You might have preferred that your race was in the sunshine, that there would be a cool breeze, that you would have just people cheering you on, but sometimes there's hostility and you cannot see the sun, but that's your race. You might prefer to have run in the 11th century or eight centuries before Christ, But no, 21st century, you're here, you're in a race. Get used to it. Now, these witnesses, what are they doing? Well, I'll tell you what they're not doing. They're not observing us. There's actually nothing in the Bible that indicates that the saints are watching us. You know, you're about to put your hand in the cookie jar, but then you remember Aunt Maud is watching. No, that's not what's taking place. I don't believe that any saint, that's anyone who's a true believer, Old Testament saint, New Testament saint, those that have come between the time of the writing of the New Testament to now, none of them have ever had their felicity, their peace, disturbed by your and my circumstances. None of them, including Mary. The biblical Mary has never heard one prayer, not one. Though millions pray to her, she's undisturbed. She is adoring Christ, not worried about the economics of Tahiti. She's undisturbed, wallowing in the glory and the grace of the one who saved her. She said of herself, I glory in the God who saved me. I glory in his saving work. The true Mary has never heard a prayer uttered towards us towards her. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so the saints are not people to be prayed to, nor are they observing us. Dr. John MacArthur writes, The deceased people of chapter 11 give witness to the value and blessing of living by faith. Motivation for running the race is not possibility of receiving praise, from observing heavenly saints. Rather, the running is inspired by the godly examples those saints set during their lives. The great crowd is not comprised of spectators, but rather is made up of ones whose past life encourages others to live that way. They're witnesses. God can be trusted. 
He'll come through. He'll keep you. He'll preserve you. If there's miracles needed, he will do it. If you endure when you ask for a miracle and you don't see it, he will give you saving strength and enduring power to go through it. R. Kent Hughes Hughes writes this, They, speaking of the witnesses, are not live witnesses of the event, but witnesses by the fact that their past lives bear witness to monumental, persevering faith. I agree. It echoes the words describing Abel in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, Though he died, he still speaks. And those these pe- although these people have long gone, they're still speaking of the power of God and the faithfulness of God. And they are witnesses to us. God can be trusted. God can be trusted in the midst of your storm and in the midst of your race. You've seen these men. You've seen these women in their race. But now they've left the track. They're now in the stands as witnesses, testifying as witnesses of faith that pleases God, faith that overcomes, faith that perseveres. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. This is it. Well, this is it. Yeah, your life is it. Your life is the race. You're on the track. This is your time. There's no avoiding the race. You might say, I don't like athletics. It doesn't matter. You're in the race. It's happening. It's happening now. The starting gun has fired. Run! That's the message. You as a Christian are in the race. Your Christian life is the race. And your entire life is the race. Not certain highlights. You know, in 1997, I I, I ran a good lap. I hope that was uh, recorded. No, it was recorded, but your whole Christian life is the race. It's demanding. It's arduous. It's exhausting. It'll push you to the limit. It will be the means of you expressing grueling effort. I've never been in a race that it didn't require all that I had. I was exhausted at the end of every race I ever had as a kid in school and high school. And this is an endurance race. An endurance race. This is, in fact, as we look at Chapter 12, we see in verse 1 the phrase, let us, and this is the ninth of similar passages in the book of Hebrews, the ninth let us passage. And the Christian life is not to be lived alone, even though you have an individual relationship with God. It's a let us, let's together, let us together go forward. Let's not go back. The race is on, run. So this race that you're in, When does it end, Pastor? It ends at the coming of Jesus Christ, the second coming, or else the day you depart to be with the Lord, whichever comes first. You realize this. You might be a healthy child or teenager, a young adult, young man, young woman. You're in the race. And if you are a little more elderly, living in a wheelchair, you're in the race. Even on your deathbed, You're in the race. So run. Well, I don't have strength to run. Yes, you do. Maybe not physically, but spiritually, you are in the race. So run. And run unencumbered. That's the message. Look with me in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do you see that? We need to divest. We need to get rid of some stuff. We've got to be serious about this race. We must throw off everything, strip down for the race. You know this, you've seen this when you watch the Olympics or some other athletic event. The runners strip down to the absolute minimum. No one in a race wears a coat, an overcoat, and heavy boots. Even if the temperature is freezing outside, 
No runner even has a wallet with them. No, one, no runner has money in the pocket. They don't have their car keys. Because everything that prevents free movement has to go. Comfort is not a consideration. You're running. Something's different from what is normal. And that's the message. As the decades have gone by, I've been shocked by how little is worn by athlete, athletes today. Um, I've often thought, is that legal to go out in public wearing only that? Well, that's a breeze compared to the ancient world. Uh, if you go to ancient Greece or uh, uh, examine some of the portraits of athletics in the first century and beyond, the athletes were stripped naked. You look at drawings of athletes from the ancient world and Honestly, you have to look away. They ain't got nothing on but a smile. But runners have to have that winner's mentality to be competitive. You and I have to get rid of everything that would hinder us, that would prevent free movement or hold us back in any way, even to clothing. Two things have to go, according to the text. Every weight and sin, the sin which clings so closely. I like to deal with these in reverse order. Let's talk about sin. There was a man who uh, went to church. He was well and his family were not. He went to church uh, by himself and he came back and the wife asked, well, what did the preacher preach about? He said, sin. Well, what did he say? Well, he was against it. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. It's a grievous thing to sin before a holy God. And God says here, for even the Christian, we've got to get rid of sin which clings so closely. This speaks of what uh, another translation records it as besetting sins. Some sins are more prone to us as individuals than others. Have you noticed that? Some people never have a problem with this, but they have a problem with that. Other people have a problem with that, but not with this. But sin should not be the lifestyle of the Christian. Though he's prone to sin, though he falls into sin, he gets up and rises again. He doesn't swim in sin and says, that's the way I am. No, there's something in him, in fact, someone in him, the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, who's working out the process of holiness. And he puts in the true Christian a desire to flee from sin. When we sin, we grieve ourselves as well as God. So what's in view here is our own individual and specific sin, a besetting sin, as so the translations render it. It's very possible to get entangled in a certain sin And for others to say, I can't believe that you'd fall into that. But then they have a different sin, maybe the sin of pride. And they look down their spiritual nose at people. But some sins, have you noticed, are more tempting to one person, but have little little appeal to others. Let's list some sins. Falsehood, lying, envy, jealousy, covetousness. Lust, gluttony, malice, hatred, pride, laziness, bitterness, anger, rage. Here's what our tendency is. We tend to minimize our own sin. Our tendency is to become immune to the gravity of our own sin. But other people, they've got real issues. Well, we have an issue from time to time, but nothing that big. But the message of Hebrews here is, wake up, it's big, it's bigger than you think. For you and your race, you have to eliminate sin, deal with it. May I ask you, what is the sin that so easily entangles you? What is the Holy Spirit perhaps highlighting as you read these words in Hebrews? What sin is especially apparent in your life? What is your life dominating sin? Whatever it is, God is saying, lay it aside. It's no good for you in the race you're in. 
Then we come to the word weight. We are told, lay aside every weight. Literally, the weight that hinders. You see, not all hindrances are sin. There's a distinction being made here. There's sin and there are weights. And we are to discard both, but they're not the same thing. A weight or hindrance is something that is not wrong in itself, but it weighs you down spiritually. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. May I ask you, what's slowing you down? It could be many different things. There's nothing wrong with art, with sport, with entertainment, with movies. Well, I have to qualify that. Uh, Many could be listed as sin, sinful to watch. But it's entirely possible for the thing that is entangling you to be a weight, something that takes up too much of your time, too much of your attention. And it means the neglect of more important matters. Video games can be fun, though some are filled with evil things and should be avoided. But some play games every moment they can to the neglect of the spouse and family. Sport. I happen to love football. Soccer, as it's called in the United States. I follow Liverpool. You know that. The greatest soccer team in the world, it's obvious. Um, Amen. I hear that. Amen. God bless you, brother. Uh, I'm just stating the obvious. I mean, who is top of the English Premier League right now? Liverpool, of course. Duh. You know, I like the fact that the game lasts about two hours. It doesn't consume all my time. I can watch it and then get on to other things. R.C. Sproul loved American football. He wore his Pittsburgh Steelers uniform as he watched his team play. But I can't imagine him spending the entire day doing that, watching that, uh, so that he wasn't prepared to preach. I can't imagine him mounting the pulpit and say, say, you know what, I don't have a message, but boy, didn't the Steelers do well. I saw 17 interviews and more. Oh, wow, it was amazing. No, I can't imagine that. The point is, some things are weights rather than sinful in and of themselves. Sinful things, we should avoid them completely. Weights, that's a different thing. And they need to be discarded if the Holy Spirit is pinpointing those things in your life. Otherwise, a good thing, but now it's weighing you down. It's taking you down. It's taking you downward. If that's the case, then the message is clear. Get rid of it. Consciously evaluate your own life. What's hindering your advancement? Only you, before the Lord, could answer that question. Other people might have their opinions. Opinions are like noses. Everyone's got one, and there's usually a couple of holes in it. But be convinced as you pursue God. Ask Him to reveal to you, is this a weight I don't need for my race? That's what's in view. If it's sin, you've got no business with it. Let me ask you, what is your cherished sin? Then get rid of it. Put it to death. John Owen once said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. But if it's a weight, if it's dragging you down, also get rid of it. Too much is at stake. Run. So because you're a runner, travel light. So for a weight, what would that be for you? Perhaps it's a mental burden. Don't allow that weight to slow you down in the race. Cast your anxiety on the Lord. I read of uh, Usain Bolt, the sprinter. He is retired now, but he is an eight-time Olympic gold medalist and the world record holder in the 100 meters, 200 meters, and 4 by 100 meters relay. But he once had a problem, an actual severe problem. At the beginning of the race, he was so concerned about his start that he would move on from the blocks before the gun went off. And he was caught every time. 
He was disqualified time after time after time, and he never quite got over the problem until his coach came along and addressed the obvious issue, and then he conquered the problem. His testimony was this. His coach came and said this, Don't worry about the start. The strongest part of your race is the end. So don't worry about getting a fast start. That liberated him. And he focused not on how quickly he could get off, but just to get off at all after hearing the gun. And he ended up conquering the world. I want to say to you, you may be later on in life than some, but the end portion of your life and of your race can be much better than the beginning. It's not so much about how well you start, but how well you finish. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, 2 Timothy 4, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Literally, he said this, the good fight, I fought it. The race, I finished it. The faith, I've kept it. Let me ask you, how's your race going? It was once, uh, I was once the recipient of a phone call from another state, and there was uh, a gentleman interested in a lady in our church. And I got a call from his pastor. It was an interesting call because he introduced a phrase to me that I hadn't ever heard of before. And he asked about the particular person, and he asked this question. How is her churchmanship? I'd never heard of the word churchmanship. But he was explaining, you know, I've got this guy. I can attest the fact that he's a Christian. How much of a Christian is the girl? Can you attest to the fact that she loves the Lord Jesus? And is that seen by what she does in the life of the church? Does she come regularly? Is she someone who is sporadic in attendance? Or... Uh, what's her giving? And I didn't want to disclose anything, but I was able to say this, this is a good churchmanship woman. And that was uh, important for him because between the two of us as pastors, we were overseeing this event of these two coming together. The end of the story was they did uh, form a good relationship and they got married. But I understood that. And I want to say to you, how is your churchmanship? Because that's part of your life. That's part of your race. How's the race going? Are you in the race? Well, you're in the race. It's not an up-out uh, event. You join the race the moment you embrace Christ and the gospel. You're in the race. So run with endurance the race that is set before you. Run, run. Let's continue reading in verse 2. Looking to Jesus. Oh, what beautiful words. Looking to Jesus. And the message here again is obvious. You've been inspired by these Old Testament saints. You've read their history. You've known them from childhood, Hebrews people. You know these stories. Absorb yourself in their stories. Be inspired to believe God as they did now. In a certain sense, forget them. They're not your source. Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. You're not going to get faith from Abel. You'll be inspired by him, but you won't get faith from him. You get faith from Jesus. You will be inspired by reading of the life of Abraham, but you won't get faith from him. You get it from Jesus. Jesus gave Abraham faith. Jesus gave Abel faith. And Jesus gives faith to all who call upon him. Looking to Jesus, who he is and what he's done. Another translation reads this way. Fix your eyes on him. How do you do that when you can't see him? That's the faith walk. We walk by faith, not by sight. We fill our minds with the truth of God's word and we say, this is true and this is true for me. He is true. 
He's true to everything he said about himself. And I believe him. I focus my attention on who he is and what he's done. I fix my eyes on him. Many people talk about conversion and they talk about conversion to the church. Roman Catholics are prone to do that. I came to the church at a certain time. The the, the one who comes to true salvation comes to Jesus, not to the church. You come to Jesus, you look to him and he saves you and places you in the church, but it's not the church that saves you. It's not the church that is mandating to you faith distributing grace. It's Jesus. When God gives you grace, he doesn't give you anything but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is who we look to. And when we look at him, though we feel weak in ourselves, he fills us with strength. I can't do it, but I can do it through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it through him. I can go through them. This circumstance, whether I I'm involved in abundance or hardship. Again, a passage relating very much to Hebrews 11. Though I go through great trial or I'm abundantly provided for, Christ strengthens me. So we run with endurance, looking to Jesus. You know we could camp out on the name of Jesus for 18 weeks and not exhaust it. We'll be doing exactly that in heaven. It's scheduled, believe me. Looking to Jesus, then it says the founder and perfecter of our faith. This word founder means author. It means originator. It means he's the one that started this faith operation in your heart. You didn't have it by yourself, but Jesus gave you faith. Isn't that amazing? He's both the object of our faith. We look to him. He's the object, and yet he's the one who gave us faith. He's the author of our faith. If you've got a book, it didn't write itself. There's an author. And if you've got faith, you didn't get it by yourself. There's an author. Jesus is the author of your faith. Oh, everybody's got faith. No, not everybody's got faith. If you've got faith... Your eyes have been opened to the beauty and the magnificence of Christ and you couldn't have seen it without Christ giving you eyes to see. Have you ever shared the gospel and someone said, that's great for you, I just don't see it? Yeah, that's right, they don't see it. Unless the man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. They cannot see the beauty of the gospel. You tell them the gospel, have you ever had a blank stare? Of course you have. Yeah, they just don't get it. They don't get what? The beauty of the gospel that though we are sinners in God's sight, God sent his only son into the world to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, then at the cross die an atoning death for sinners, then three days later be risen from the dead bodily and is now at the place of all authority in the universe so that anyone who calls on his name, repents and believes, is not only forgiven all sin, but given righteousness. The very life of Christ is credited to their account. It's an amazing gospel. Have you heard it? And if you embraced it, you could never be bored with it. You could never say, you know, I've heard that before, so I'm not interested anymore. No, there's something in you that says, that's the only reason I'm going to heaven. Why should God let you into heaven? I can think of no reason why I could be ever led into heaven, but Jesus Christ died for sinners and I qualified as a sinner and called on his name. And so this gospel is transformative. And this Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. That word perfecter means finisher. It means one who carries through to completion or perfection. Isn't that encouraging? You see... If you got yourself into the kingdom of God, you can get yourself out. But because Jesus gave you faith, he that begun the good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. Our confidence is not in our ability to stand. We're called to stand, we're commanded to stand. But the reason I believe every true Christian will still be standing this next Thursday and a million Thursdays from now, is because Jesus gave you faith 
And his faith doesn't collapse. His faith doesn't fail. His faith endures. Well, doesn't the Bible say that he who endures to the end will be saved? Yes, and God gives you faith that endures to the end. You go through trials and you think, I can't take anymore. And then there's something that rises up in you and says, yes, I can. I can go through another day. I can believe God today. I may not feel I can take anymore, but I'm filling up my mind with the word of God. And now I'm looking to Jesus. And that's where I find my strength. I can't do it by myself, Lord, but you can in me. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Who he is and what he's done. That's a mindset. The founder and perfecter of our faith. So the message is this. Run, run. Don't be distracted. You know, in any race, when you look back, you lose ground. The competitors around you go ahead of you when you look back. There's nothing to go back to. That's the message of Hebrews. Onward, we press We go on to maturity. Everything in Hebrew says, go on, never go back. There's nothing to go back to. We run looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And then we're given a description of what he did. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What amazing words. Jesus had a mindset. He was not just living for the moment. He was living beyond the moment to what was ahead. And what was ahead was the glorification of the Father. He was about his Father's business. And on the agenda, one certain day was to go to the cruel, rugged cross. That was his race. A race like no one else. None of us can say, my trials are as weighty as Jesus. He endured. He endured. Who for the joy set before him. What was that joy? Fulfilling the Father's will. Saving the very sheep the Father had given him in eternity past. Saving all of them. At the cross, Jesus saved his elect people. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints. Do you realize this? All our sins were borne by him. Your past sins, your present sins, and even your future sins. How is that true? Every one of your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross. Well, you're just giving people a license to sin. No, I'm not. People sin without a license. No, I'm just saying this. Next Thursday or Friday, should you sin, Jesus doesn't have to go back to the cross and do another sacrifice. He did it all, once and for all. By his one offering, we've seen in Hebrews, he perfected a people. And so your Christian life starts with the knowledge that if God has given you faith, you will endure to the end. You will continue to believe. The faith that fizzles was flawed from the first, one saying goes. The one who walks away never had salvation and lost it. But according to the Apostle John in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they were never of us. They were never the real deal. Are you the real deal? How will I know? Because you've got true faith in Jesus and you've gone through some stuff. And you still love Jesus. Because Jesus gave you the love for Jesus in your heart. Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. So fix your eyes on him. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him. That's you guys. That's me. That's the people of God all around the world. Millions and millions of men and women, boys and girls, who he saved at the cross. He endured all things. The cross, the shame, everything that was thrown at him because he had something else in view. You can't do this because you have willpower alone. You have to have a mindset. And in this race, we have to have the mindset. This life and all it throws at us 
is only temporary trouble. Keep your place in Hebrews. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You'll find it after chapter 3. There it is. Look at verse 16, the Apostle Paul writing again. So we do not lose heart. Maybe some of you need to hear that. Don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. When you hit 55, you understand. (laughs) Our inner self is being renewed quarterly, two times a decade. No, day by day. Day by day. For, I love that word for, it's linking what's come before. How is that so? For the, this light momentary affliction. Now, 2 Corinthians is all about suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, Paul wrote about some trial he went through he didn't even think he'd live through. We despaired even of life. It's okay to say that. That's where Paul was. And yet in the light of eternity, he called it light momentary affliction. Now, some of our trials last a week, sometimes three months, sometimes 30 years, sometimes even longer. But in the light of eternity, it's just an instant. It's light. Oh, light compared to what? Well, we'll come to that. Light, momentary affliction. All our trials are temporary. Is that the best you got, Pastor? Well, I came for a word from God, and you're saying this is just temporary? Yeah, in the light of eternity, get this. You might be in a wheelchair for decades like Johnny Erickson Tata, but the day she meets Jesus, you know what she's going to say? This was light. This was momentary. This affliction. You think, well, she's had enough trials. She doesn't need any more. And then she gets breast cancer. Then she gets it again. And you think, I don't know how she still trusts Jesus. And what she would say is, she's not the author of her faith. Jesus is. And he's the same for you. He'll do the same for for you no matter what you go through. This momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things which are seen, the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporary, transient, temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. This too shall pass. I remember hearing a preacher saying his favorite phrase in the Bible was, and it came to pass. (laughs) It's not here to stay. In this life it may stay, but the moment you embark on eternity and see Christ face to face, it's over. The trials are over. The trials are over. So for the perceived joy ahead, Jesus endured. And he now is our example, even as he's the one we look to. He was God, but humbled even to the point of death, death on the cross. Yet he knew he would be exalted as the conquering triumphant king, the king of all kings, the lord of all lords. One man said this, talking of Christ, read the last part of the verse, verse 2, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what he saw as he went through what he went through at the cross. I'm going to endure this cross. I'm going to despise the shame. I'm I'm going to not live because people are shaming me and be influenced by that. I'm getting past that to something greater that's beyond what I can't see with my eyes right now. Seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That speaks to the fact that he stands at the head of the universe One man said it this way, the sitting, the sitting posture of Jesus after his ascension indicates that his sacrifice is complete and accepted once for all. He's done it all. He knew if I go through Friday, I'm going to get to Sunday. And then I'm going to get to the ascension. And then I'm going to be seated to be able to intercede for all those I purchased in my death. So, saint of God, come on, come on, come on. Don't give up. You can do this. Keep going. 
inspired by the great heroes of the faith, now inspired by them, in a sense, forget them, now looking to Jesus and keep your eyes there on him because he is competent to perfect your faith as he was to initiate it. Two quotes and then we'll close. James Montgomery Boyce wrote this, the only thing that will ever get us moving along this path of self-denial, because that's what the race means, and discipleship is fixing our eyes on Jesus and what he's done for us, coming to love him as a result, and thus wanting also to be with him both now and always. Jesus is our only possible model for self-denial. He's the very image of cross-bearing. And it is love of him and a desire to be like him that we take up our cross and willingly follow him. That's our grace. What's your cross? It's where your will and God's will cross. John Owen writes this. A constant view of the glory of Christ will revive our souls and cause our spiritual lives to flourish and thrive. The more we behold the glory of Christ by faith now, the more spiritual and the more heavenly will be the state of our souls. The reason why the spiritual life in our souls decays and withers is because we fill our minds full of other things. But when the mind is filled with thoughts of Christ and his glory, these things will be expelled. And this is how our spiritual life is revived. Saint of God, you're in a race, run. And if you've never entered the race, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved as you do. The one who saves you will give you not only the faith to call upon him, repent and believe the good news of the gospel, but to live a life in glorification of him so that you run and you run well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who inspires, the one who is our example. He is that, but he is certainly more than that. He's the one who died and is now risen again, seated in the place of all authority at the right hand of the throne of God. Write these truths on our hearts, and as we look to him, may we run and run and run with never a thought of quitting. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.